Hey guys, so I wanted to um, do another installment on my talks about feelings and emotions. Um, and this again is taken from Muso Soseki or Muso Kokushi's book, Dream Conversations. He's a Zen master that lived um, many centuries ago. And he was the emperor's teacher, which was considered a great honor at that time. And he's one of my favorite Zen authors or teachers that I've come across. My teacher introduced him to me uh, by giving me this book a long time ago, so many decades ago at this point. And if you enjoy this kind of content about spirituality, non-duality, Zen, yoga, please subscribe to my channel or join my Patreon page for more content like this. So let's get right into it. Uh, this is from a passage called Softening Worldly Feelings. And if you haven't already checked out my other two videos on feelings and emotions, part one and part two, please do that as that will help you maybe understand and give some context to this uh, video. So the founder of Zen spoke of two ways of access to awakening, by principle and by practice. Access by principle refers to direct unification with the fundamental. Another word for the fundamental might be your true nature. In yoga, that would probably be the way that it was referred to. Without depending on training. So access by principle refers to direct unification with your true nature without depending on training. Since this is not possible for everyone, the founder also taught four practices. So this uh, already highlights that there are differences um, between people's abilities when it comes to spirituality. And this really shouldn't be a surprise because people have different physical abilities, um, people have different mental abilities, people have different emotional abilities or skills. And so when it comes to spirituality, it really is no different. Some people are like uh, natural born athletes when it comes to spirituality. You can explain something to them once and they just get it. And the funny thing is these may not be spiritual people. Spiritual people. These are people who may just be living their lives and they may not realize that they have this sort of talent for uh, spiritual understanding and comprehension. And it might be only when they come into contact. They may have no interest in spirituality. So this is a very important point to understand. There are people who are into spirituality. It's a lifestyle. And yet they, they may have very little spiritual understanding. And they, it doesn't mean they're bad people. And being spiritual, having spiritual understanding, does not make you a good person. Okay, so this isn't uh, a way of judging people. I'm not talking about people being good or bad. I'm just really trying to be very pragmatic, um, pragmatic about this. So some people are, again, sort of like spiritual superheroes. They just get stuff they really can understand, and that's what he's saying here. Some people, they can go directly to their true nature. They can understand that with very little practice, uh, with a few words, maybe even just coming in contact with a spiritual teacher. Other people, they can be around the most spiritual being. Uh, they can receive shaktipat. They can do all kinds of practices, and yet the progress is very slow. That doesn't mean, however, that they should quit or stop, um, because it's said that every uh, effort that's made on this path um, is not wasted. So. Any little effort that you make in the direction of spirituality will not be wasted, is not in vain, okay? All right, so the first two practices, and this is again for people who cannot um, reach their true nature or what he's referring to as the fundamental um, right away. They need practices. This is also explained in the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, which is an ancient tantric text that I really like as well. So again, I'm using Zen here, um, but it really isn't any different. 
Okay, and it's recognized in the yoga, the tantric yoga tradition that some people again have this ability to just understand, and other people they need a lot of practice. They need a lot of they need to make a great, great effort just to make any small progress. But any progress is worth it. So the first two practices are designed to counteract the tendency to be distracted by feelings related to pleasing and displeasing situations. Again, my last two talks, we talked a little bit about this, and this is huge for us. Again, think of how you are motivated through your life. Think about the choices that you make. Think about how many choices you make just based on whether a situation you're going to find yourself in is going to be pleasing or displeasing to you. So the vast majority of us are basically like thinking animals. You know, you can train an animal to do almost anything just based on uh, giving it reward or punishing it. And so we are very much the same way. And in fact, this is often how we train other people, try and manipulate other people. Might be our children, right? We give them something sweet when they do something good and we punish them when they do something bad. This is a very, you know, sort of basic way of operating. You might say a not very awake way of operating. I'm not saying it's not necessary. And again, I'm not saying you're a bad parent if you use that to motivate your children. But again, we want to be aware of these things. When we train a dog, when we train our husband, right, using these kinds of techniques, it's essentially just in the realm of what we can do with animals, right? Reward and punishment. And again, in the other talks, I talked a little bit about Raga and Devesha. So go back and listen to that if you don't know what those terms mean. So in displeasing situations, you counteract irritation, resentment, and lament by viewing such situations as products of your own disagreeable behavior in the past. So this is great. Uh, this is a, an example of what in the Buddhist and the yoga tradition could be seen as the teaching of karma or of rebirth. In these traditions, it's generally accepted that your situation, your current situation, is the product of past uh, choices and past um, things that you have done or said. And that's usually called karma. And so we, if we feel like we, some just bad thing happens to us, let's say I just seem to randomly get in a car accident and everyone agrees it wasn't my fault. I just seem to be the victim of some situation. This can be a real showstopper for us psychologically. This can shut us down if we think that something has happened to us unfairly. We did not deserve a hardship and a hardship happens to us. Again, it creates a very displeasing situation. That can cause us to go into depression. We can lose all of our energy and our focus, and we just basically become um, worthless and useless. We, we aren't able to motivate ourselves. So this teaching here is telling us that these situations we're taught in this tradition that these situations are the result of your own behavior in the past. Now, we might say, well, I know what I did in the past and I never did anything that deserves me getting into a car accident. And that's where the teaching of rebirth comes in. Basically, the teaching would say, well, that might be true for this lifetime, but you don't know what you did in previous lifetimes. So if you've been reincarnating for you know thousands of years you probably were a murderer in one life you might have also been a king and a saint you may have played all these different roles so they would tell you that you can't just simply look at what you remember and understand from this lifetime to judge these things these things go back much further than that um, another name for karma is often just cause and effect and another name that uh, or another 
uh, way that it shows up as um, you reap what you sow. So that's maybe more familiar to people in the West and people from the Christian tradition, that you're going to reap what you sow. So if we believe that idea, you reap what you sow, then if we are um, reaping something that's not good, then by logical extension, we should be able to say, well, then I probably had sown that at some point, whether I remember it or not, whether I believe I deserve it or not, right? So I might uh, have done something that I justify in my mind. I say, no, I've been good my whole life. I've been great. I don't deserve this hardship. But maybe from a different perspective, we have been very cruel or inconsiderate, or maybe we do deserve it, okay? So we aren't really the ones who can judge this. Um, you might say if you believe in a, a God, sort of a God principle, then God would be the only one who could judge us. I'm not saying that you need to believe in God for this, but I am saying, and if you've followed my teaching for a little while, you know I talk a lot about non-judgment. And non-judgment applies both to ourselves and to other people. And basically, we don't have enough information. We don't have a broad enough perspective to judge if what we're doing is really ultimately good or bad. So the best policy for us is to withhold judgment as much as possible, to assume that what is happening is what is meant to happen. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't take action. This doesn't mean that we don't get involved in life. It just means that we get involved with a very sort of light attitude. We don't let um, our judgments draw, bring us down or get us angry with other people or to judge other people. We want to stay very open-minded and open in our heart as well. He goes on to say, in pleasing situations, you counteract complacency and attachment by reflecting on the impermanence of all conditions. So this is another important principle. So we have karma, the teaching of karma on one hand, and we have the teaching of impermanence on the other hand. And this is important to motivate people when things are going well. So if we understand the principle of karma, if we do good deeds, then eventually we will begin to reap um, uh, good rewards, right? If we lived a good life, again, it may not be this lifetime, uh, but if maybe we're really, if we were really good in our last lifetime, then in this lifetime we're rich and we're powerful and we're beautiful and we have a lot of influence and people like us, we're charismatic. Well, have you looked at maybe the way that some people in Hollywood live. I'm not saying everybody, but sometimes it seems like people who have money, have power, have beauty and influence, they live a very hedonistic life. They're often not people who are curious about spirituality and about the nature of things. They very often sort of accept that physical pleasure and, um, having nice things and having influence over others is the point of life because for them that's an easy game to play and so often they get drawn into that well if these people were exposed to these teachings they would be encouraged to say hey look you have it good right now but um, all things are impermanent so if you don't continue to build up good karma through good actions and thoughts and deeds, then eventually you will run out of good karma and then your fortunes will turn, maybe not in this life, maybe in another life, okay? And again, guys, I don't really wanna get into whether I think karma is true or not, whether I think rebirth is true or not. I don't think those are important points. If you're understanding the way he's laying this out, and if you're understanding the way that I teach these principles, these are mental, psychological tools. Okay, so debating whether or not it's true or not is beside the point. The point is, 
Is it useful? Does it work? So he's saying how the founder of Zen used these teachings to counteract certain tendencies in our mind. One is, you know, again, being motivated by pleasing and unpleasing situations. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to do here. So if I'm in a pleasing situation, instead of getting complacent and getting attached to that situation, I think about impermanence, the fact that this too will pass. As nice as it is, as good as it is, um, I'm still relatively young. Um, I still have relatively good health, but if I live long enough, that will change. We all know that, that as we get older, um, our health is not as good. Even if we're relatively healthy for our age, we just do not have the health that we had when we were younger. So we all are living within this same truth, is that, again, things are impermanent. Um, I used to have jet black hair from head to toe. Now I have much more gray hair than I used to, and that trend will continue. So again, things will continue to change. If I'm attached to my jet black hair, I can try dyeing it, I can do all kinds of things, but it's going away, right? We know it's, it's coming. So this is just the nature of reality. Again, many people think Buddhism is, you know, depressing or, um, you know, pessimistic. It isn't. It's realistic. It is pragmatic. He, uh, the, the Buddha and Buddhist teachers, good Buddhist teachers, point to the way that things are. So again, whether or not these teachings, these psychological tools are ultimately true is beside the point. Because you might say, ultimately, there's only one truth. So one um, teacher I studied with once said that a myth is a lie that's told in service of a greater truth. And I love that because so much of spirituality is like that. Um, they can be thought sometimes of white lies or things that are partially true and not ultimately true. And they are pointing to a greater or deeper truth. So when we get too obsessed about, you know, was there a Noah's Ark? You know, is that a factual statement? Did Jesus actually, was he actually resurrected? Did he actually rise from the dead? Did he walk on water? We are beginning to get um, off the track when it comes to spirituality. When we're really interested in spirituality, it really doesn't matter these are, uh, that these are factual statements. That's not the point. The teachings, just like the postures and the breathing and everything that we do in yoga, is targeting the heart, mind, and the gut of the human being. And that's where we should see the transformation. When we're too worried about, is this true or not? Is this a fact or not? Then we are starting to look at the finger instead of the moon. Some of you, again, who have studied with me for a while have heard me uh, talk about this Zen teaching, which is when someone is pointing at the moon, look at the moon and not the finger, right? So if I say, look at that amazing moon, and you say, God, you haven't clipped your nails in a while, and your finger is kind of dirty. What have you been doing? You're missing the beautiful moon that's in the sky that I'm trying to point out to you, okay? So hopefully you can understand that. When I start to say, is reincarnation really true? Is that you know, then we're starting to miss the point because the teaching is designed, again, to create a shift in the heart and mind. And you could say gut as well. Those are the three areas that I speak about um, that is helpful for us to, again, gain awakening, enlightenment, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so continuing on. These two practices, they're practices, just like our postures, just like our breathing, just like meditation. These are practices. They are mental practices. When I am attached, I think about impermanence. When I'm in an unpleasant situation, I think about karma. I caused this. I may not remember it, but I caused this situation in some way. So I'm not going to say, oh, woe is me. Why did this happen to me, right? All right. 
These two practices are used to equilibrate the mind in order to open the way for unadulterated concentration on higher objectives. So when we are too obsessed with getting ahead, with keeping up with the Joneses, with um, you know the day-to-day -day stuff of trying to please ourselves or trying to avoid unpleasant situations, there isn't much energy or time uh, or mental space left for higher objectives, for spiritual objectives, right? We're just obsessed with our physical situation, with where am I, you know, how am I doing? Am I making enough money? Am I getting respect and love from other people? And again, um, these teachings are not about dropping all of that stuff. It is about creating some space in our heart and our mind so that we can begin to pursue these higher objectives. Why would I want to uh, pursue these higher objectives, we might ask. My experience has been that you have a greatly increased capacity for love, for peace, and for joy. And what could be wrong with that? What else do we really want? If I want a Lamborghini, it's because I think it will bring me joy. If I want to have a romantic relationship, it's because I think it will make me feel content and bring me happiness, right? So we want the things that we want because ultimately we all want peace, love, and joy. When we break it down, if we keep asking, why do I want this? Why do I want this? Why do I want this? we end up with because I think it will make me happy or because I think it will bring me a sense of contentment or peace, right? So this is an important thing to understand because you might think, well, I'm not interested in that spirituality stuff. But usually that means that you don't think spirituality is the way to make yourself feel what you're wanting to feel. And when we've um, been around long enough, we realize that spirituality is the only way to make ourselves feel how we want to feel long term. Okay, long term. Yes, short term, a romantic relationship can make you feel absolutely incredible, but that feeling will not last. It will not. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with your relationship or that you shouldn't have a relationship, but that feeling will come and it will go. We all know this. So how do we hang on to that feeling? How do we sustain that joy of getting a new automobile or a new house or a new lover? How do we hang on to that? How do we hang on to the feeling of how we feel after a great vacation where we're so relaxed and so peaceful? How do we keep that? while working and driving on 285. This is what these teachings are about. This is why I would want to pursue this, okay? So he goes on to say, as the scripture says, however, to stir thoughts is error, and to stop thoughts is also error. Stopping thought is not enlightenment, and projecting subjective designs on an unlimited objective cannot lead to success. So this is a very important point. I can't tell you how many times after teaching people meditation, they go home and even though I say this is not about stopping your thoughts, they still think that their meditation is a failure if they have thoughts. Okay, so you can't stop thoughts. You could take out your brain, I guess, and then you won't have any more thoughts, but you really wouldn't be a human being anymore. Human beings are designed to think. So this is not about stopping thought. It's not about not stopping thought, okay? So it's about the right relationship with thought. And again, some of you might have heard me say that before, but I'll say it again. This is about the right relationship with our thoughts. If we have the right relationship with our thoughts, then we have peace, we have joy, and we radiate love. When we do not have the right relationship with our thoughts, we suffer. It's as simple as that. So you can ask yourself, is there any situation in which you still suffer? Then there's a place for these teachings in your life. 
if you are completely free of suffering, not because you're living the life of your dreams, but because you can actually be in any situation and find peace, joy, and love there, then you don't need these teachings. You are what we would call enlightened, or at least a very awake person. You can go and become a spiritual teacher, but you need to be honest with yourself. Okay, most people, when things are going their way, again, it's easy to think that, oh, I have peace, I have joy, I have love. What about when things aren't going your way? How did you react when the pandemic started? Did you find yourself getting frustrated or scared or angry? Or maybe now you find yourself frustrated, scared, or angry. Maybe at first it was fine, but now you've been laid off, or now it's been going on too long. Well, these teachings are talking about cultivating these um, emotions or this connection in a way that it does not dissipate or go away. Um, there's much more I could say about that, and it's not, in, it's not entirely true the way that I stated it, but again, it's close enough uh, for what we're talking about. Okay, so he goes on to say, therefore the founder taught a third practice. So again, we have two practices already, which is karma, right, or rebirth. Again, if you were born, um, deformed, that is not a fluke. It is not because uh, for no purpose or no reason. You were born that way because of past um, deeds and situations. So you need to accept that and move on. Again, that's, the, that's that tool. And then the second one, again, is impermanence. If we're living the life of our dreams or living our best life, it's very easy to get spiritually lazy and just not, I don't need spirituality, I have everything I want. Physical reality is great, right? I just um, pleasure myself with caviar and uh, salty, fatty foods all the time, sugary things. I just eat and do what I want, right? That's hedonism. Um, and again, it doesn't lead us where we want to go. And that's why people who live hedonistic lifestyles, it, they very often end up as alcoholics or drug abusers because, um, you know, you eat chocolate cake every day for breakfast. Eventually, that doesn't do it for you anymore. And you need to pump up the volume. And so cake, alcohol, all the normal stuff, sex, eventually that's not enough. And so where do we go? We go to the next thing. Okay, well, maybe this drug will do it for me. We get into more and more powerful drugs, more of those drugs. And again, we all know what a drug addict looks like, right? Who's bottoming out. It's not a pretty sight. They're not healthy. They're not happy. So that path just does not work. Um, and again, the historical Buddha, he had explored both of these. Um, that's, what it's, that's what we're taught. So therefore, the founder taught a third practice, which is not seeking anything. As he said, to be enthralled with anything is to be enthralled to that thing. So again, if you've learned meditation from me and you've understood my instructions, they are basically to be there, um, not looking for anything, not trying to make anything happen. And this is what I'm teaching here with that. Just be there, be with what is present. If there are unpleasant sensations that are there, again, this is due to karma. If there are pleasant sensations there, you don't wanna grasp onto them, you don't wanna chase after them because they will go away. That is just the nature of this reality that we live in. Maybe there's an alternate universe or another plane of existence where that's not the case. But Buddha wasn't a teacher in that realm. He was a teacher here. So his teachings are for us and the situation we find ourselves in. So any experience has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Enlightenment and awakening is about that which is beyond experience. 
beyond that which has a beginning, middle, and end. Enlightenment, awakening, does not have a beginning, it does not have a middle, it does not have an end. It is timeless, it is eternal. Okay? So he goes on to say, not seeking anything is still not considered ultimate. Not seeking what you think is there is a doorway to finding out what actually is there beyond your imagination. Only finding without seeking is called meeting the source everywhere. Again, this is what I teach with meditation. Whether or not this comes across the way that I teach it, I don't know. But this is what I'm trying to teach you to do is relax, let go, be present. And what you will find at first usually is what we in yoga call your samskaras, which is uh, your conditioning. Your conditioning rise up into awareness. And for many of us, our conditioning is not pleasant. So many of us have to go through weeks, months, years, decades of just sitting there with unpleasant sensations, emotions, thoughts. Again, if you see this as a short-term race, you're probably going to get frustrated, uh, fed up, and give up. Be like, I've been doing this meditation thing a long time, and I don't feel joy, I don't feel peace, so I give up. Um, but if you do not seek for anything, you will not be displeased, right? If you're not expecting to have a pleasant meditation, then when your meditation is unpleasant, it's fine because you don't have any expectation. And again, we talked about expectation in the last video about this subject. So please go check that out. He goes on to say, keeping in touch with the source in this way is the essence of the fourth practice taught by the Zen founder. This practice, known as accord with reality, is still in the realm of achievement and is not what Zen literature refers to as the great rest. The great rest is what Patanjali talks about in the Yoga Sutras there. He, uh, in the first four lines there, the first line is basically, um, you know, yoga. Well, now we're, now the teaching of yoga goes on to say yoga is the quieting or stilling of the disturbances in the heart mind. And then he goes on to say then uh, the seer can rest in its own true nature. Rest in its own true nature. So there definitely is a quality of rest that comes with awakening. And this is why striving in the wrong way, what in Buddhism we talk about right effort, but what that implies is there's a wrong effort. There's a way that we can make an effort that is not conducive to awakening. So it's odd to say, but we want to make an effort to be effortless. We want to make an, we want to be vigilant about letting go and relaxing. And again, that can be a very tricky subject for people to understand in practice. Um, so anyway, that's what I have to say about that. All right, everyone, so I hope you got a lot from this. Again, if these kinds of talks and this kind of content is what you're interested in, please check out the Mahapatha Yoga YouTube page. Um, like us on Facebook, again, mahapathayoga.com. Go to the website, www.mahapathayoga.com. Sign up for the newsletter and for our mailings. Give us your email. And finally, check out the Patreon page where uh, if you get a lot of value from this, uh, we need your support. I need your support as a teacher. So you can contribute there. And there are also links down below if you're on YouTube or on Patreon for how to contribute, make one-time contributions like Venmo or PayPal if you prefer. If there are any questions, please leave them in the comments. Um, let me know what you think about these subjects. This is pretty deep, heavy stuff. And these are things that often we don't speak about in yoga classes. Um, and even sometimes in yoga trainings, these things are sort of scooted over because um, 
it can be very challenging to talk about and understand these subjects. So don't be discouraged if you find them challenging or difficult, if you find your brain kind of hurts a little bit when listening to a talk like this. That's a, that's a good thing. That means that your understanding is being challenged and you might be growing a bit in the spiritual department. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Jai Bhagwan. Namaste. I'll see you next time.